Well, this morning, I'm continuing the book of James. I invite you to follow along in chapter 3. I'm going to be sharing from the New American Standard Version this morning. So if you'd like to look down the screen or from your Bible this morning. James 3 says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horses' mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body, and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds or reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, that no one can tame the tongue, it is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh? May the Lord bless this word this morning. Who is James writing to? Us. Which church is he writing to at this time? Jerusalem. Jerusalem? You look at the first chapter, it says those who were dispersed abroad under the persecution, those who were fleeing for their lives. <coughs> He's writing to them, and he says this, let not many of you become teachers. James, are you out of your mind? We're dispersed, we've got to start the churches. How are you going to start the church without a teacher? We need teachers. Don't be scared of them, James. Let not many of you become teachers, my brother, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Well, great recruiting campaign, James. Love it. Sign up in the foyer after the service today. Knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Stricter. The word in the Greek is megas. Kind of sounds big, doesn't it? A stricter judgment. Maybe there's going to be a few more questions to answer at the year, end, of, end of the year review. A little more accountability. Teaching. In my estimation, I believe the Scriptures too is one of the primary purposes and needs of the church. And I don't think we ever have enough teachers I was a new Christian, and maybe you were too. I'd only known the Lord for maybe a couple of months. Been attending the church for a few months when I was about 21, and uh, they came to me and said, uh, will you be a substitute teacher for the senior high Sunday school class? Uh, didn't grow up in church. Sure, I'll do it. I was going to to follow the Lord. I'll tell you what, I never stressed so much in my life. I think I had headaches preparing for that. And uh, it was a great opportunity. But I don't remember the caution sign that James is posting. Teachers wanted, <laughs> proceed slowly. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Well, it was kind of a fast track for me in the Christian walk because in less than a year from that time I was at Warren Pacific College studying for the ministry. And it was probably a 
little bit after that that uh, I started hearing about the uh, opportunity for ministry training, an internship, Vancouver Church of God, under a young youth pastor named Randy Hood. And, uh, Randy and Sean, not missing the children are here with us this morning. Good to see you. Randy now pastors in Spokane. And so, uh, in the spring of that first year of school, I looked up after him and uh, volunteered to get involved. And he put down a little bit more criteria for being a youth ministry intern. And I don't remember all the paperwork, but I do remember something about you can't date the girls in the youth group. <laughs> <laughs> You have to commit to 20 hours a week. Now, there's a lot more things I learned. I can't remember everything on paper. I remember a lot more from Randy's life than what was on paper. There's a little bit more spelled out. Here in this church, we have a teacher signing up regarding the walk with the Lord, and if they're in the right relationship with the Lord. Is there anything in life that would happen to them from ministering and being in that position? In the two and a half years I was in the internship under Randy, I only remember one intern that had to be dismissed. I don't think that was an easy thing for Randy to do. But to be in a teaching position is a very important role. And why? I think James spells this out. Is it because those who have received much, much is required, perhaps? In verse 2, James says, For we all stumble in many ways. In how many ways? Amen. Who stumbles? Amen. So, okay. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, we all stumble in many ways. If we don't stumble, we're perfect. Let's see. I don't think too many of us are going to be able to say, ah, oh, yeah, I'm perfect. Um, we know somebody that was, but it may not be us. What is the evidence that one is truly perfected, complete, mature, which that word perfect means to be mature and complete? It's our tongues. If you want a good litmus test for how mature a person is in Christ, it's your tongues. Um, let's take a little sidetrack here. Thank you, those who came out yesterday morning to change all the doorknobs and locks and hardware on our doors yesterday morning. I appreciate it very much. Was it a frustrating process for anybody changing out the old stuff or the new stuff? A little bit. Dwayne, thank you for the honesty. They're different <laughs> systems. They're made differently. Some of the holes had to be tailor fitted a little bit. But you know what? As I walked around and checked on how people were doing, because I wasn't doing so great, I. Uh, I never heard a curse word come out of anybody's mouth. Working on those frustrating doorknobs. Thank you, gentlemen. So if we don't stumble in what we say, we're showing maturity in Christ. That means uh, every word we speak is kind of like when we're hiking and have a sure footing. You're thinking about where you step before you step there. Is a solid ground. Um, so if we're going to recruit teachers, we're going to listen to how they speak. We're not going to recruit gossips. You know what a gossip is? Can you tell me about somebody who is a gossip? Oh, I guess that means gossip. Okay. Uh, there's a old illustration I modified a little bit just because of where we are these days, but there are four preachers, and uh, they got together and they said, you know what, we're always telling our congregations to confess their sins to one another and, and uh, be saved, and uh, maybe we should do something like that, we should get together, we should just, you know, confess our sins and kumbaya together a little bit and pray for one another. So, one preacher said, well, I'm kind of new to this internet thing, but, uh, 
I kind of found there's this site that you can gamble on a little bit. Preacher's ears perked up, and no one said, well, I kind of stumbled across these sites, and I don't mean to, but sometimes I click on things that uh, probably shouldn't be clicked on. Um, another one says, well, you know, I wouldn't buy it in the store, but I can order it online now and have it delivered to my house, and nobody knows about it. The fourth preacher, he wouldn't say anything. Wouldn't say a word. Clam shut. But they keep, kept prodding. Well, what's your weakness? What's your vice? So finally, he gave in. Well, if you must know, my vice is gossip. And I just learned how to use Facebook, and I can't wait to get back to my computer. <laughs> I've been to memorial services, done a few of them, funeral services. And one of the lines that impresses me the most of those who testify to personal pastoral is when they say, and I can tell it's meaningful, I've never heard him or her say a bad word about anybody. That just impresses me, and I think, man, that's, that's who I want to be. Not a gossip, not a slander, not a boastful person. A turtle can lay a thousand eggs and not tell anybody. But when a hen lays an egg, the whole country is informed. <laughs> Some of us like to be a hen. Okay? Maybe we need to have a little bit of self-control. And we're not going to recruit those with abusive speech. Colossians says, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. So as those who have been chosen of God, whole and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. We have a choice. When conflicts come, we can escalate or we can de-escalate a situation. And it seems like it's mainly through our tongues. We can throw fuel on the fire or we can seek to put out the fire and resolve the issues. There was a study that I read among couples who had ultimately stayed together. And the study revealed that five out of every 100 comments made about each other were put downs among couples who had split later. Five out of every 100 couples. There are five words out of every 100 of those couples who had split later. Ten of every 100 comments were insults. That gap magnified over the following decade until couples heading downhill were fine, flinging five times as many cruel and invading comments and validating comments as each, at each other as happy couples. How many comments come out of our mouths that hurt our spouse rather than those who build up? And I want to say to you, if we want to put out a flame, if we want to put out a fire, if we want to resolve a conflict, alcohol is a flammable material. And I've spoken with enough people to understand. And even recently, I've had couples share with me that things were not good. But we quit drinking, and things aren't escalating like they used to escalate. Everything's not resolved, but it's better. Hey, uh, hmm. you want to help the tongue? Keep the bottle out of your mouth. Verse three. <coughs> Now, if we put the bits into the horses' mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Now, James, I think, here is trying to tell us 
why it's so important to have teachers who are self-controlled. If we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. What does the bit do? You make them. Control. Take control. Do you know how it does it? Pressing on the top. Pressure. Now, do you put, when you put the bridle in the mouth, you put it over the tongue or under the tongue? Over the tongue. Over the tongue. The bridle goes over the tongue. It controls the mouth over the tongue. And there's a lot of different bridles, and some are softer on the mouth than others, and, and such. But if you have the bridle under the tongue, the horse still has control of its head. The horse will sometimes fight to get that tongue over the bridle. So it still has control. Um, I was a novice rider, a young teenager. It was the very first and last horse show I was ever in. Of course, me and my dad's a horse trainer, and he gives riding lessons to this day. Um, probably will later this afternoon. Um, but I never had a riding lesson. Uh, but I was riding my horse around the arena with probably, I don't know, probably 20 others. Outside of me, just going around and around. That's why I didn't keep with I might just going around and around. But uh, horses, you know, walk, you know, so we walk, right? That's the judge, judge uh, the performance. And then they say jog, and of course the horse would jog. And that's a hard one because you're trying to sit still right and you're bouncing up and down and all that kind of stuff. And then the gallop. Yippee, here we go. <laughs> around. And I think what happened is, uh, my horse wanted to go for a little bit more of a run than I wanted to go for. I think it had its tongue over the bridle. And when I was behind the judge's back, I would just pull back on those reins. But the horse wouldn't slow down. There goes the horse trainer, son, around the arena, <laughs> trying not to run over the judge as his horse is running away with him. But as much as I pulled, I couldn't stop the horse. If the bridle isn't over the tongue, if we haven't submitted ourselves to God's word and God's lordship, Christ's lordship in our lives, if he is not the one that we've said, you control my life, you guide my life, we can toss our head and we can get that control back and we can end up making a fool of ourselves. I don't think I got any ribbons that day. As a matter of fact, I know I didn't see ribbons that day. Because <laughs> my horse was out of control. Why should there be a stricter judgment for teachers? Verse 4 says, Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Have they ever uh, sailed the ship a little bit? Oh, okay, I see one head nod. Rick, I didn't see your hand go up very high. Rick, did the wind ever blow you somewhere that you didn't want to go? Or want to blow you somewhere that you didn't want to go? Okay. So if that ship gets away from you, you end up somewhere that could cause some hazards, couldn't it? Whether it's in the path of another ship, or grounded on a sandbar, or up against the rocks, or further out than you want to be. Wherever the inclination of pilot desires, wherever he sets that rudder, even though the wind blows strong, the ship can still stand course if that rudder's in the water. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. As the tongue directs, determines the direction of the horse, the rudder determines the direction of a ship, the teacher determines the direction of a congregation, or a family, or a movement, as the church, teachers, to be self-controlled and led by the Lord are vital to the life of Christendom, of the church. And there's one more he gives as an example. See how great a force is set aflame by such a small fire. How many of you have seen little fires become big fires. 
I mean, she said a little fire that became a big fire. <laughs> Anybody ever seen somebody hurt trying to put out that fire that you started? Okay. Little spark. It only takes a spark. Come on, let me go. Okay, we'll stop there. <laughs> it only takes a spark to get a fire going. All it takes is a tongue cut loose. One small part located in a critical position, one element that can uh, ignite something else and make a huge difference. Verse 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. And the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. Whew, man. The very world of iniquity. The tongue? Maybe I should get rid of that thing right now. If your hand offends you, cut it off. You know? If I am offensive in what I say, and if I am misleading in what I teach, you should remove me, or at least rebuke me. Amen? To be a teacher is a critical position in church. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity, and the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body, and sets on fire the course of our life, and is set on fire by hell. The course of our life, what you are taught, can direct your life down the good path or into iniquity. In Matthew 15, 18, it says, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. So our real issue just isn't our tongue. It's our heart. And it's the spirit that directs our life. Whether it's the spirit of the Father in heaven or the spirit of this world and of the devil. The one that seeks to bring resolve and renewing in relationships and the one that seeks to destroy. Are we under the Father's control, are we bridled? Have we given Him the Lordship of our lives? There is only one who has ever been perfect, who never stumbled in what He said, and that's Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God. John 8, 28 says, So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, and we have a cross there this morning to remind us that He was lifted up, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak the things as the Father taught me. Jesus spoke what His Father taught Him to speak. When Jesus was on the cross, and they had done all these torturous things to Him, and now they were hurling abuse at Him, what did His tongue let out of His mouth? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He bled grace. He spoke grace. It came out of his spirit. Out of his heart. In James 1.19, James spoke and said, This you know, my beloved brethren, but, one, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Quick to hear. Slow to speak and slow to anger. Um, you might want to write this acronym down uh, in the note uh, area on your bulletin. An acronym, it's a word that has other words attached to it to help us remember things. The word is THINK. T-H-I-N-K. THINK. The T stands for IS IT TRUE? If it's not true, we don't need to bother speaking it. The H stands for, is it helpful? Is this going to help the situation? Or, <laughs> not. The I stands for, is it inspiring? Does it inspire anyone? Does it encourage anybody? <coughs> the N stands for, is it necessary? You know, many things can be true, but sometimes they're not necessary. And the K stands for, is it kind? 
is it kind? Now, if we can run that criteria through our brain before we start spouting off, is it true, is it helpful, is it inspiring, is it necessary, is it kind? Maybe that would be part of be quick to hear and slow to speak. Think before we speak. Place our putting on solid ground so that we don't stumble. I think I've shared before, but the, the time I and my mom and sister and, and friends went to hiking on Crystal Mountain up in Washington, the, the ski resort. It was summertime, hiking down below the tree. And uh, I decided I'd jog a little bit going down the mountainside. Well, that wasn't working out so well. So I decided I'd try to speed up so I could cut up hill a little bit, turn my momentum. Well, that worked out a little bit less. Before I know it, I was going head over tail down, <laughs> down the mountain slope in shorts without a t-shirt on. <laughs> you got it. Uh, I had to hike the nearest cheerlift station to get down the hill the rest of the way with the breeze blowing through my back that was just ripped open to my knees and my nose. And Mom poking the tub and I got home and washed them. All the dirt and the grit out, oh, that felt real good. <laughs> you know what? I learned to be a little bit more sure-footed. We need to be a little bit more sure of our words. Because they can cause a lot of pain. Not only to the people around us, they can come back and bite us as well. When we bridle our tongues, we're not perfect. The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I've already attained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature, complete, perfect, should take such a view of things. And if one, on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example. Paul was an apostle. He was a teacher. He was a rabbi in a sense. Disciples follow the rabbis, right? Brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say to you with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. We have them bright in our tongues. We have not allowed him to bright our tongues. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is unearthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await the Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control. What's everything? Does that mean our tongues too? Can He bring our hearts under His control? We'll transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Does He start when we get in heaven? It starts when we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. When we ask Him to forgive our sins. When we invite Him to come and live with Him His Spirit to live in our hearts. When we're born again, He forgives us, He cleanses us, and He begins His work of this and He continues it. And if we stumble, we confess, and we seek Him, and we strain toward the goal of being like Him. Because he will transform our holy bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Back to James, verse 7. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is restless, evil, and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. I want you to listen to this next line, okay? My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Don't say, well, I'm not perfect. No. 
we confess, we struggle to follow Christ, and He meets us where we are. We receive forgiveness of sins and cleansing, but each day we get up and we determine, I'm going to speak words to bring Him honor and glory. The people know that He's my teacher, and I am becoming like Him. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brother, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? That'd be quite the grafting job, but uh, not naturally, for sure. Nor can salt water produce fresh. Our fleshly nature cannot produce the heart and the tongue that glorifies God. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. There is a stricter judgment for those who would be called teachers. There is so much at stake. The future of the church. Randy, new thought this morning. I can understand why you expected a lot of those who worked on you. It wasn't just the youth who were before us, it was your children. Is there a drum? Your grandchildren today. The teacher is the tongue that directs. The body. The teacher is the rudder that directs the ship. The teacher is the flame that, if not careful and let out of control, can consume a force quickly. Who's piloting your ship? Who's controlling your tongue? Or are we just adrift, afloat, finding ourselves shipwrecked on the rocks? Oh, let not many of you become teachers, but I certainly hope you will become teachers. And maybe we'll have a sign up next week in the foyer. <coughs> but just realize it's only by Christ, by His power working within us, and us submitting to His Lordship that we can accomplish and become who He desires for us to become, so that we can be free to live in relationships that have more happiness than sorrow, that we can have right teaching, that we can have men in the church that we can look up to and say, I want my kids, I want my son to grow up like him, and women in the church, and we can say, I want my daughter to grow up like her. I'm so glad that's her teaching. Amen? Amen. Church, let's stand together as our worship team comes forward. I don't know where you're at this morning, but God does. I don't know what, what you're struggling with this morning, but the Lord does. I don't know what you aspire to be with your life, but I know God aspires us to be like His Son, Jesus Christ. And I know we don't do it by our own strength. You may feel like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just stumbling. I'm, I'm sliding down the slope. I'm causing more problems with my mouth than I'm resolving. But I think all of us would agree, Lord, we need your help if we're going to bless your name.